thank you very much, uh, Nisim. So Nisim was right in, uh, in the introduction. I was really lucky that I worked on a protein that was interest to some, but not too many. So uh, usually I, I give this talk in front of uh, molecular biologists, biochemists, uh, sometimes uh, cancer specialists, but never uh, before mathematicians or uh, philosophers, or <laughs> and, and rarely before, before system biologists and uh, bioinformaticians. So I hope uh, maybe I get some uh, good ideas. So as you can see here, I changed a little the t title. The autism uh, we did already, we published three years ago, so I thought it's a, little, uh, it's a little old. So I kept here the Fragile X, and I added uh, something. Uh, I added depression. That is something new that uh, we didn't publish yet. So we'll see how it will develop. So basically, that's what uh, Nisim alluded to. Uh, we start, I started this uh, four decades ago. And uh, to try to find out which is the protein, this was part of my postdoc, which is the protein <coughs> that binds here to this very unusual uh, structure that was discovered in 1975, <coughs> more than 40 years ago, that was called the cap. It was called the cap because it was the first uh, nucleotide at the five prime end of the mRNA, so it's a cap for the mRNA. Very unusual, it's a seven metal G that is linked to the rest of the messenger RNA that is going this way via a five prime to five prime triphosphate bridge, which is very unusual. Again, the, all along the messenger RNA, the bases are connected via the ribose in the three prime to five prime phosphodiester ball. So of course, this was the first question that came up. How does it work? And uh, it has to usually everything works through, through protein. What's the protein? So I purified uh, this protein. Uh, this doesn't work. So, so I did this experiment <coughs> that uh, turned out to be, you see it was published here in 19, 1978, so exactly 40 years ago. And it turned out to be the best experiment I ever how it works? Uh, you, you have to press it hard, huh? So this is the, ve the best experiment that I did in my life. And this is cross-linking a labeled cap to a mixture of protein in, in the cell, just a cell mixture, and see what, what cross-links specifically. And I got a very good adv advice from an excellent chemist, Charlie Cantor. Without him, I, I wouldn't have been able to do it. it uh, it's using so sodium cyanobarohydrate uh, to stabilize a bone, the shift bone. And basically what, what we found, I found is that there is a protein here, we called it later EIF4E, that crosslinks specifically to the cap because here you see the crosslinking, you have the cap analog, just a seven metal GDP, and you see zero crosslinking. So of course, the next step was to purify it. And then later it was called EIF4E, standing for Eukaryotic Initiation Factor 4E. So there are many initiation factors that are involved in recruiting the ribosome to the messenger RNA. There are 13 of them, many of them are uh, multi-subunits, so there are at least 40 different polypeptides associated, maybe not as complex as transcription, but still complex, sufficiently complex to make life uh, difficult. But this one behaves in a very clear way it recognizes the cap structure, but it's not by itself, it's in a complex. And the complex is a rather stable complex, consists of EIF4G, which is a scaffolding protein, 
and which binds the EIF4A, e, the cap binding protein, and another protein, EIF4A, which is a helicase, which unwinds the secondary structure of the messenger RNA in the 5 prime untranslated region. That's very important in order to enable the ribosome to move and get to that initiation codon. So this is a simplified model because there are many other proteins involved assisting in this. Uh, there is a EI4B, EI4H, etc. But this is the core mechanism of all this process. Once you have the unwinding, then the ribosome can bind and then uh, continue with the translation. Basically, what we have is an uh, ordered process. Here is the messenger RNA. This is here the AUG, where you start uh, translation, making the protein. Sometimes these are very long. It could be about 3,000 nucleotides. <laughs> and you have this inter uh, interaction of the EIF4F through the EIF4E. This recruits now another factor, which is EIF3, a multi-subunit. This recruits now the ribosome, the small subunit with other factors. Only one of them is shown here, a ternary complex, which brings the metRNA. And all this uh, big complex that assembled here at the end of the messenger RNA has to now scan or traverse the 5 prime UTR to reach here the AUG. And then the 60S joins the last subunit, and then you start to make the uh, polypeptide, adding amino acid to make the polypeptide. So now this, this is a very important process in the cell has to be tightly regulated, and there are many mechanisms. One of the major mechanisms we found are there are proteins which are called 4-EBPs, 4-E-binding proteins, small molecular weight proteins that binds to EI4E, prevents the assembly of the complex, and then you inhibit translation. And I'm not talk, telling to, the, uh, to you today about uh, this mechanism and the consequences, but it's very important in cancer uh, because uh, it turns out that uh, this is a, a reversible complex. And as you can see here, these four EBPs can dissociate when you apply hormones, growth factor, and mitogen. And then, of course, the 4E can function again as part of the complex. And, and the key to all this regulation of the, this 4 uh, EBPs is via uh, the mTOR pathway through this PI3 kinase and all these components that are involved in cancer. So you see here downstream of this mTOR complex, there is a 4 EBPs which are phosphorylated here and released from the EIF4E. So I won't tell you about this pathway today. I want to show you another pathway in which EIF4E is involved and can be activated, and this is the RAS pathway. Again, very important in cancer, but I won't tell you the, the cancer part that we are doing. I tell you about the neurodevelopmental and uh, the disease, the fragile X syndrome, uh, I tell you about depression. So the EI4E, as I told you, is a part complex with EI4G. So it's part of a complex with EI4G, and it can be phosphorylated on one side, serine 209. And there is a very specific enzyme, the only enzyme that we know that can phosphorylate, only kinase, phosphorylate the EI4E is called MINK. There are MINK1 and MINK2, first discovered by Tony Hunter 20 years ago. And MINK gets a signal from the ERK pathways. We see here ERK, MEK, RAF, RAS. And once the, the, the MINK binds to the carboxy terminal, part of EIF4G and phosphorylate the EIF4E. So we wanted to study this in cancer. We make a knock-in mouse, 
So you have a serine to alanine uh, mutation. It cannot be phosphorylated. We show it very clearly. Turns out that in cancer, these mice are resistant to cancer. And we have all uh, ideas uh, how it works and all this. But again, I, I won't tell you today about cancer. I'll tell you about the uh, fragile X syndrome, and I'll tell you why we got into that. So first of all, once you have the phosphorylation of EAF4E, you have a subset of mRNAs that became better translated. And the, the way to do it is what you do is a polysome profile. Actually, you separate the number of uh, ribosome on the messenger RNA on the sucrose gradient. So when the messenger RNA is translated well, it has many ribosomes on it because the initiation rate is fast. So you can have five up to 10, maybe more, depends on the length of the messenger RNA. And then in the sucrose gradient, you have them at the bottom. A messenger RNA that doesn't, is a poor translator, will have one or two or maybe three, will have it close to the top of the, of the gradient. You separate them. So now you can do different treatments and see how you change the, the position of the polysome for different mRNAs uh, depending now on the condition. So we looked, one condition here is comparing wild type, to a fibroblast, to fibroblast in which the uh, serine 209 was mutated. So instead of uh, uh, serine, you have an alanine, you cannot get phosphorylate. And then we came up with a list. So I don't give you this traditional IPA ingenuity pathway analysis and, and, and all the rest because we didn't have enough targets to do the statistics. So basically, I have a list here, very short list. It's a cutoff of 1.5, as you see. And just you look by eye, you don't need all the bioinformatics, et cetera, and, this, uh, and you start to see the pro-inflammatory, you know, aggressive behavior for cancer, et cetera. So you see all the CCL1, CCL2, CCL7, CCL9, the inhibitor of NF-kappa B, you see MMP9, you see MMP3, that for some reason, I, I, here, here is MMP3. So this led us to some experiment in cancer, but also led us to the experiment on fragile X syndrome because of MMP9. What happens in fragile X syndrome Many proteins change because the the proteins that is uh, Can you remind what is fragile X? Hmm? Can you remind what is a fragile X syndrome? That's what I'm going to tell. So so yeah, so to better instead of giving the introduction by words, maybe I'll show you what it is. This is the fragile X syndrome. So it's X linked. It's encoding one protein, which is called FMR, fragile mental, mental, uh, mental retardation protein. And what you can see here, this is the fragile, the, the fragile site, it breaks, you see it here. And then what you have is, as I'll show you in a minute, in this patient, uh, in, in, in males, you don't make the protein, I'll show you why. So, Fragile X syndrome is the most common form of inherited intellectual disability. Boys are 30 to 60 percent co-diagnosed with autism, but there are many, many uh, other uh, syndromes. You can recognize them, uh, you know, if you, you once learned what is fragile X, uh, you, you recognize them, you know, the long ear, long face, and uh, you, uh, the way they behave like autistic and uh, repetitive behavior. And this is what happens. So this is the gene, as I told you, encoded by the fragile X uh, site. So there are always repeats in human. In mice, there are no repeats. In human, there are repeats. If there are less than 45% repeats of, of this triplet, CGG, there is no disease. 
And this is in the first intron, which has a, a promoter activity. So you make the messenger RNA, you make the fragile X fmRP protein. Between 45 and 200 repeats, you have some disease, uh, not, not all the penetrance is not 100%, uh, but uh, sometimes you have disease. When you have 200, then you have the, 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 the critical disease. And it uh, accumulates for, for, for generation by generation, right? It's yeah, yeah, it's from generation to, to, to generation, and then you, uh, you have expansion. And so generation between parents and children, sort of, right? Right, uh, exactly. So here what happens, once you have this many repeats, this C become hypermethylated. Once you are hypermethylated, you don't have a promoter activity. So you don't have a messenger and then you don't get now the protein, the FMRP. FMRP is a translation inhibitor, right? Uh, so many people did uh, different assay, especially the clip, etc. They, they, they found out a subset of mRNAs, but there are too many, about four of them. Four percent of the mRNAs are substrate to fMRP, so you don't know which one are the important one. Of course, it's always the problem. It's not just uh, uh, specific to this, this one. But we wanted to concentrate on MMP9 because we saw the MMP9 in, in our uh, list of mRNAs that are affected by the serine phosphorylation. So what do we, we know? We know that we know that MMP9 proteins levels are elevated in <coughs> fragile X, and I have to say that MMP9 plays a major role now. In, in, the, in the function of the synapses in the brain. And uh, we don't know exactly the mechanism, but you need them in order to get a synaptic plasticity and learning and memory. What was shown also before we started the experiment, some inhibitors of MMP9 and 2, they are not specific, so you see 2 is a target, some others. They, 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 re they rescue the fragile X behavior in mouse. So you can make a mouse knockout of, of the fragile X of the FMRP, and then you can get, as you see in a minute, the, the very, very, very similar symptoms to what we see in humans. So this is the symptoms. So this is the Fragile X, F FMR1 minus. So in, in, in females, it's, it contains one X chromosome. In, 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 the, in the humans, it doesn't have. So most of the experiments are done in, in, in males, not humans. In males, most of the experiments are done in males. And these are the things we're looking. We're looking at impaired preference for social novelty, which is a classical uh, the, the, the markers of, of this patient, and that's also for autistic children in general. Hyperactivity, audiogenic seizures. This is uh, the, the electrophysiological -physio -physio uh, measurement, which is called uh, long-term depression that measures synaptic activity, so you give this uh, drug DHPG, and then you see a depression in the potential. So you see in wild type, you see a depression and goes up almost to, to normal. When you see it in the knockout, this knockout, you see this exaggeration, it's exaggerated, you do, you don't, you, it goes lower and never reaches back. So this is a classical, now again, electrophysiological -physio uh, uh, measurement of this disease. So here, here is uh, just uh, is some other, other things that we can measure. As I mentioned already, the repetitive behavior, repetitive behavior social interaction, 
Oedogenic seizure hyperactivity, this LTD that I just explained, we can also look at the atlantic spine abnormalities that are always correlates with synaptic activity in learning and memory. And it's part of the synaptic uh, transmission. So basically, this is, the, 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 this is what I described before in Word, where you, we do the polysome fractionation and, and, and we got so just to show it to you, I should have put it uh, before. Ah. So, so this is the polysome. We separate them, then we can label, the, we can uh, hybridize them to cDNA, and uh, that's how we got the list that I showed you. And this is the list. And again, uh, the MMP9 is the one that uh, we picked up to study the the fragile X. So how do we show now that it's uh, really important that it's associated, this MMP9 reduction and the phenotype are associated with the AFORA phosphorylation. So first we did genetic manipulation. So in the genetic manipulation, what we did is we took the knockout mouse for the FMR, we crossed it to our EIFOE, which is the knocking, the serin 209 to alanine. And we crossed it also to uh, heads of the mink 1 and 2. This is the kinase that phosphorylates. And as I say, this is the only kinase that phosphorylates the serin 209. What we expect now is a lower amount of phosphorylated EIFOE. And because the amounts are lower, then you expect less MMP9. You have less MMP9 if MMP9 is really important, as really advertised, we should rescue the phenotype. And that's as you can see, we published in 2014, we showed the rescue of uh, most of the phenotype, uh, actually all. And I'll show you just one of them. And this is the exaggerated LTD the long-term depression. And basically what you can see here, in this case, we didn't use a genetic, uh, genetic test. We used a, a drug. So this is a, an acute recovery and rescue. So this is a cercosporomide we, de uh, we, we developed with Lily for cancer. It's, it's toxic, but still we can use it here. And this will reduce, inhibit the mink 1 and 2, and reduce the phosphorylation of EIFOE. So, so you see here the reduction in the phosphorylation of EIFOE, and it's more than 70%. And here is the test of the long-term depression. As I told you, when you, you use the knockout mouse, the black one, you see that the exaggerated LTD goes very low and uh, that doesn't recover. This is the, the wild type, the, the, the white one. And here is the one when you add the cercosporomide. You see, you completely rescue it. You now it goes, it behaves exactly like the wild type. So now the problem is uh, we use a drug that could never be used for these uh, children with the, the, the fragile X, and we have to come up with some, something better. And we, 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 of course, everybody thought about something. And I had a postdoc, Arkady Kotursky. Uh, he came up with the ideal drug. And you will see why I say ideal, because it indeed seems ideal. And this is metformin. So before going into that, uh, yeah. In what cells is it working? In what cells is it working? Yeah. In the neurons. Which neurons? The, the pyramidal neurons, for example, or in the hippocampus. It's so also in the, uh, in the PFC. SHRNA for mink. Huh? SHRNA for mink would be much more specific. No, he did that was I do. Yeah, it's SHRNA for mink. But he did the knockout. But knockout. It's, uh, it's a mink knockout. So it's very specific. But we used for other things. But uh, when we published, in t I, I, I told you 2014 we published. 
At the same time came up a paper that actually showed it even in a clearer way than we did. Well, they asked a simpler question. And the question was, uh, it is always to find this. The question was, let's take a knockout for the MMP9. So we remove it. And to see what it calls to the fragile X knockout, if it can reverse the symptom. And that's exactly what, what they did. We thought it's an excellent complementary story we sent together to, to sell the, the papers. So the, the reviewers want us to do her experiment. Yes. And uh, she, she was asked to do our experiment. So of course, there was no use. So we tried to convince this is Ethel, uh, Sidhu et al. And we tried to convince them that maybe we should do, but the, 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 they had a grant they, they had to submit anyway. So they submitted this and we submitted somewhere else. So as I told you, Arkady Kotursky came up with this uh, bright idea to use metformin. So this was uh, f two years ago. It took us a long time until it, it got published. It got published in Nature Medicine in 2017. And why, why do I say ideal? Uh, metformin is an FDA approved drug used uh, to treat diabetes type 2. Type 2 diabetes, 100 million people take it every day around the world. This is a drug with the least side effects that you can imagine. So you, the worst you can get is diarrhea. Yeah, of course, if you have a, a, a kidney, a damaged kidney, then you have a problem. You're not allowed to use it. You, you get uh, the ketoacidosis, etc. So that's why this is the first line drug for diabetes. And most importantly, it's cheap, extremely cheap. It's uh, out of patent for a very long time. So why did we use uh, metformin? We used it because metformin suppresses mRNA translation via inhibition of ERK and mTOR pathway. We saw that it will go through the mTOR, but it actually worked through the ERK. And as I told you, ERK is upstream of the MINK, which is upstream of the uh, phosphorylation why, of it. Why metformin uh, inhibits? Uh, that, that's the big question. That's we, do, we don't know. We know, uh, we don't know actually. Most people uh, don't know. Exactly. Metformin target complex one in the mitochondria. So it the the, I know, I know, I know that. that do we have a whole list of things that metformin <laughs> does? That probably right, right, no, right. No, no, no. The bona fide so, target so is complex one in the mitochondria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in answer to your question, look at this paper. So you have one, two, three, yeah, four. Yeah, don't believe everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> right. So we have five papers, uh, but we could by, by ourselves, okay, because you don't believe everything, you do the experiment yourself. <laughs> and, and mink inhibits ERK1 in our hands. So uh, again, you can, you can uh, challenge even the people who did it in the lab, but then you ask several people. So at the end, you, are, you, you, you run out of challenges. So uh, I accept now that, uh, mink, uh, that uh, metformin inhibits ERK. So here, what we do is uh, we injected metformin I find it again. We injected metformin, 200 milligram per kg. That's about uh, a little bit more than you give to patients with diabetes. And over 10 days. So here you can see the schedule. And then at the 11 days, we look at grooming. Uh, we look at social days, a test after 12 days. This is what I showed. And this is the, chamber, the very classical experiment to people study behavior. So you, you, you have here uh, two tests. One is the social choice test. One is the social novelty test. And, and the first one, 
basically what you do is you see here on the left there are two chambers and uh, here you don't see uh, anything here there is a stranger and the mouse that we're testing uh, always is social so always uh, most of the time not always will go here and sniff this mouse and sometimes uh, it will go also to the other one uh, goes around this uh, doesn't doesn't see anything and uh, doesn't spend much time you see how fast it went out so this is the, the, the second test here. And as you can see here, here you have two mice. On the left is a familiar mouse. So you cohabituated your mouse with this one. He already knows it. He's a friend. Here is a stranger. He always he likes to go more to a stranger. So you will spend more time with him, with the stranger, rather with the familiar mouse. So of course, you can measure it very easily. And here, here are the results. So this is our mouse. So it can be either a wild type or a, a, a knockout of FMR. This stranger one, stranger two. And you see now with the wild type, as I told you, it will go more to the stranger, to the one that he doesn't recognize, rather the familiar. When you look now at the black, which is the knockout, is no difference. So no social preference for uh, the stranger. Now, this is the critical one. You had metformin. The way I described to you, it corrects it. So now you do other tests, like grooming. So this is the classical test of repetitive behavior. So you groom yourself. There are uh, different stages of grooming. You can learn from the old stages something. And basically, you can see that now the knockout mouse grooms itself twice, uh, twice the time as the wild type. But when you add metformin, you correct it. Also, the number of grooming bars is corrected. Uh, but something that's very interesting that is corrected and still this we don't understand but tells us a lot. The fact that it's corrected tells us something that about the specificity. And this is the, the macroorchidism with, which is enlarged testes. And again, it's amazing that this is the same phenotype in males and also in the mouse. And you can see here, although it's not as strong as before, you can see even here some correction of the size or the weight of the testes. So I told you about the dendritic spine. So here you can see again uh, the, the, what, you, what you can see by microscopy. And uh, basically, you can see the spine density in the knockout is increased and most of them are immature spines and again corrected by metformin and there you can see the 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 the, the, the spines that are increased so you see a lot of uh, uh, philopodial which is immature and the mature one are less and again corrected by the metformin the ltd yeah so i mean the effects are very clear. Yeah. But I, I have one problem. I, yeah. I was told that metformin only works in the liver. Only uh -huh. the liver has the transporter for metformin. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. That's huh? another question. Right. Whether the effect of metformin is systemic, yeah, yeah. systemic or cell autonomous. Right. I, I'm not sure that metformin even can go through the brain barrier. Right. You know that? Yeah, yeah. It does? Yeah, and you find the metformin inside the brain. So if you cell autonomous... You do IP, system? you do IP. So is it a cell autonomous or, or systemic effect? So that's still a question. We don't because know. Because what could happen is yeah. that metformin reduces insulin level in the blood. Yeah. So therefore you get less in signaling. We thought about this and we have some experiments that show that it's not this... It's not the case, but I cannot rule it out completely. So it's, it's a very good point. But as you note, I put the emphasis 
on the correction of the disease, not the mechanism. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the mechanism we are studying now, we, for example, we know that there is an increase in the insulin receptor on the cells, right? Increase, increase of insulin. The opposite. Huh? Less, less error. What? No, it's insulin erectile. receptor. So you get more, more, more erectile. More erectile. Yeah, that's okay. yeah. So that's that shows that it's a cell Wait. autonomous. Oh, okay. So if we, uh, I'm really, uh, I'm almost convinced, but uh, eighty percent. Maybe it's a feedback effect. Right. They, uh, they see less insulin, they elevate the insulin receptor. Right. So these are all important questions. But let me go through the data. And, and basically, the LTD is also corrected, like I showed with the cercosporamides. I don't have to show this again. And uh, so, it's, uh, so here you do all this electrophysiology, which I don't do myself. Look at the spontaneous uh, miniature excitatory postsynaptic currents. And uh, you have always to do it if you want to really uh, convince the people that, uh, that, that know something about uh, synaptic plasticity. So again, you can see the excitatory uh, signal is much, much, much higher in the, in the knockout, and you correct it again with the metformin. Uh, also, when you correct the basic biochemical uh, phenomena, which is the increase of translation. Again, this is an inhibitor, the FMR, so it's an inhibitor. You increase it now, you increase the translation, this is the increase, you reduce it now with metformin. Caesar you reduced, and what I want to show here, you see a lot of panel, but the, the message of all this is everything that we actually predicted in terms of the signal now of the phosphorylation is exactly what we predicted. Uh, so for example, as you can see here, this is the MEC, the phosphomec. You see it's increased now in the knock in the knocking. You see the phosphor EI4 is increased. You see the phosphor ERC is increased. And what's more, most important, the MMP9 is increased in the mouth. And when you look now, uh, the, uh, all, all the one, the last one, and the bluish one, which is metformin, all of them are corrected. This can be done, as you say, both cells, both in the hippocampus, also in the uh, prefrontal cortex. So two major, two major areas of, of uh, it's not good. So two major areas now of the brain that have to do now with the intellectual ability and, and the other syndrome. So basically, w once you presented it, we presented at Gordon Conference, they are sitting all the clinicians. There is no good drug to fragile X. And What's easier than to take metformin and give it to the patient? So it's a very low hanging food. And that's what they exactly they did. So the, 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 the Randy Hagerman, uh, sh she's, she's not on, on this paper, but Randy Hagerman, she did and gave to her patients in Davis, California. And actually the, this, the, the slide I showed here shows you that you can get a similar phenotype in Drosophila. The, the phenotype is not, not similar, exactly similar to the mouse, but the title is Insulin Signaling Misregulation Underlies Circadian and Cognitive Deficits in Drosophila Fragile X Model. And these this are the, uh, now the clinical trials that are being done now. A lot, a lot of patients now take metformin as off-label, right? So that's a kind of a problem for the clinical trials because how could they get into the, this uh, 
the control group or placebo, etc. But still, they, they, they found enough patients and they started it. And this is the paper that came up almost together with us, uh, showing this metformin as a targeted treatment at Fragile X syndrome, as, as you can see again from, Cali from uh, Davis, California, Rodney Egerman. She didn't have many in this study, like seven, but in all of them there were improvement. And then there is this uh, anecdotal uh, d d d things that I, I get emails from people in Spain or whatever they are. They are in the society, the Fragile X Society, so the father tells me he gives the drug to his son. He sees big improvement. Of course, he doesn't uh, say anything scientifically, but it still looks like if metformin is uh, really helping him, uh, uh, helping this patient, uh, this will be the, as I said, from the beginning, the ideal drug. And as you know, many people take it uh, to extend life, so they can live even longer than the average person. So uh, this, these are the different uh, grants uh, I should mention here. Azrieli is a very uh, rich developer. He had a, a son. He has a still, he is dead, but he has a son that had fragile X. Was very interested, give a, is giving a lot of money. Now the family of the state give a lot of money for brain research. And these are the people that uh, did this work. The I, I, I still have time because I want to talk about the depression, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the people, I, I mentioned Arkady Kutowski, Christos Gokas is, is also one of the originators. These are other postdocs that work on, 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 on the autism on, and fragile X. And this is Jean-Claude Lacay, where uh, he has many, many machines for doing the LTP, LTD, and we use them a lot. So the role of EIFOE phosphorylation depression. So why, why did we do it? Uh, Some people noticed that the mice are depressed, but who, well, you know, maybe the, 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 the students themselves were depressed. They think that the mice are depressed. There are many reasons to be depressed these days, but uh, there is another and more scientific reason why, why, why we used it. So first, everybody knows uh, about uh, major depressive disorder. So it's not the, the, this kind of depression that uh, you have for a few days. So a uh, persistent uh, low mood, irritability, it has to be persistent, diminished interest in all activity, changes in body be uh, weight, appetite, sleep disturbances, uh, psychomotor acceleration. And uh, the lifetime, that's, uh, this number I I is really alarming because the lifetime prevalence of 17% uh, in the general population, high irrit uh, irritability, uh, the only drugs that are used today are the, 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 the not the only, but uh, the major are the serotonin reuptake inhibitor are commonly used, but they are good only in 30 to 40 percent of the patient. So this is not good. So how do we get now to the from the EIFOE to depression? And we get there because of the reduction in ERK. Both you see in the brief prefrontal uh, cortex and also in the hippocampus. There are other things that are going down, but the one that, of course, is related to us is the elk. So we wanted uh, to determine whether the elk phosphorylation downstream of uh, MAP kinase control depression and anxiety behavior. We wanted to uh, determine the activity of the dorsal roughest serotonergic uh, 
MPFC circuit, so that's in the dorsal raphe most of the, are, are, there are most of the cells that are producing the serotonin. And maybe I don't get to this at the end, but we'll see, we saw a lot of changes in the dorsal raphe. And uh, we wanted uh, to investigate the molecular mechanism underlying behavioral and circus alteration induced by deficit in the AF4 phosphorylation. This, I think, I took it from you, right, Nisim? You write a review on the EIF, yeah, right? right? <laughs> so I didn't give you credit here. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so the next time, actually, it's my postdoc that uh, did it, so he didn't give you credit. Uh, so, uh, so here are the tests. So you start with a very simple test. Of course, you need always everybody that knows about this behavior. You need a lot of control because you can get this kind of things because of many, many anxiety, many other things. So one of them is the, 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 the forced uh, swim test. The other one is tail suspension test. As you imagine, the forced swim test, if you put a mouse uh, now that is depressed, he, he won't try much. So it will stay immobile. The same is with the tail suspension test. You, you see here it's suspended by the tail. And again, if you have a depressed mouse, it will stay immobile. And what you see very clearly is there is a difference here. Uh, when you take the mink uh, wild type and knockout, and you can see this time immobile, you see here in the knockout, you see they are much more immobile than here on the bottom. Both male and female are uh, more in the wild type. The same is true with the EIFRE. So the EIFRE, the wild type and the knockout, and again, you can see that uh, the, uh, the knockout, or the knock-in, in this case it's the knock-in, they are much more immobile. So in this case, they, they will be counted as depressed, depressed. The same is true also with the tail suspension test, and you see the difference. So, um, maybe in this in time, I'll, I'll, I'll go a little faster. Uh, so, uh, you have also, basically just to mention, that you have also other tests you cannot rely on two tests. You have the uh, novelty, uh, novelty feeding. So basically, you, you put food, food here in the middle, and the mouse, who, which, which is not depressed, of course, will go to the food. The mouse that is depressed, here you see, stays in the corner. Again, there could be other reasons, but this is just one test. Then you have the open field test. It's exactly the same. The depressed one uh, will uh, stay in the center. They are afraid to go outside. It's, it's like also anxiety, but in, uh, it's true for the depressed one. Uh, so uh, here, here what you do is, again, to do, try to correct it, like we did with the fragile X. So we use the cercosporamide that I told you inhibits the mink. So you have less EF4E phosphorylation. And you see very clearly here that you have less 4E phosphorylation. And you see that you correct now again. So, so, uh, so basically, you see that the EF4E phospho phosphorylation is reduced. And when you ask uh, the, the, <coughs> the amount of EI4E is not reduced, just the phospho EI4E. And here you can see with the sarco, sarco, uh, sporamide, you correct. So this is 20 mix per keg. This time immobile, you, you, you change it from 70 seconds to about four, 140 seconds. Okay, uh, again, we go to the electrophysiology, we change it. And uh, you can see very clearly uh, the changes that you make here. This is the uh, EA, EA4E, uh, the, the wild type. And, and you can see here, uh, oh, sorry. 
with 50 uh, micromolar here, uh, we, we didn't uh, make a, a, a change, but with 100 micromolar, we could uh, correct again. So One question maybe, in your physiology plot, you have baseline and you have serotonin, yeah. but you're recording pyramidal? Yeah, so I didn't explain because I was rushing, sorry about that. Thank you for the, this. So basically, uh, what you look here is now uh, the signal in the electrophysiology, so uh, one lesson is not, not to rush. So you see with the EA4E, here is the baseline, you have here a serotonin, uh, you see now that you have an increase, right? When you do now with the, the knocking, you see that the increase, uh, here you can see at the, the blips at this, you see that it's much less. When you say serotonin, do you mean you are injecting serotonin or what does it mean? Uh, how do you do the, the serotonin? Uh, you, 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 just, you inject it, right. So you inject the serotonin. IV? No, 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 ICV. 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 I inside the prefrontal cortex. Exactly. So here you have all this connection to, you know, with the, the dorsal rafa. Here, this, this is the region. This is the prefrontal context. And uh, you see the projection. So many experiments we did on this. And, and we co could show the, the, the really the, the importance of this connection for the depression. And uh, I want to go, th that's why I was rushing with this one, because I want to go to the molecular explanation like we are, right, with the MMP, MMP9. Four, four minutes, right. So in four minutes, I'll be able to explain you here what is now the target. It's not MMP9 now. So we look now through the list, right? And, and the one that looks the most promising is this uh, inhibitor of the nf kappa b so it's uh, the official name is nuclear factor of K-like polypeptide chain non-cell in B cells inhibitor alpha, which is called IKK alpha. And the expert here, I think in the room, it's I you. Kappa B alpha. Right, I no, I kappa B alpha. But, and uh, so he was sitting the expert in the fir <laughs> first row. So why, why, why this, why did we pick up? because it's very important, plays a major role in inflammation. And there are this idea in the field, although no accepted, not uh, completely accepted, especially not by the, uh, not by the psychiatrist, uh, because when uh, we're working with the psychiatrist, we tell them, okay, that you can inhibit the inflammation. Ah, uh, it's not true, it's not this, etc. But we thought that this could be a very cl uh, nice clue to do experiment. And you see inflammation in many papers in, in uh, major depression disorder. And uh, again, not everybody believes it, but you see it in many days. So this is a, a protein that is on the outer membrane in the microglia and goes up in inflammation. And you see uh, very, very, in MDD, you see in different regions in the brain, you see here it's, it increases in the amount. And you see the pro elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-6 and TNF-alpha. So, as I told you, what we saw, and this is what we saw in the list, of course, we validated, and uh, basically, you can see the, the inhibitor now and the knock-in is much less. And uh, again, you can see it also by the profiling that it translates less than, than the, the, the actin, for example. So here is the inhibitor. And, and you can see in the wild type, it sediments at uh, position six, seven, eight of the polysomes in the sucrose gradient. 
In the knocking, you see its position 2, 3, and 4. So the rate of translation initiation is lower, which fits with the connection to the EF4E that works for the in the translation initiation. So you can see very nicely that uh, this is controlled by the, by the mink uh, one and two. So here for it, so uh, again, uh, here we can see the absorbance of this uh, polysome profile. Here you can see actin on the polysome profile. You see that there is no uh, difference here. Uh, between uh, the, the wild type and the knocking, the a 4 knocking. And here you can see the, in the inhibitor of NF-kappa-B, and you can see a, a big change. So you see in the wild type here, it's sediment in the heavy, heavy fraction. In the knocking, it goes to the light fraction. So we can show also increased Increase TNF alpha expression in the prefrontal cortex of the EI4 inokin. You can see here the again the TNF alpha. Uh, so uh, what you see here some other marker. This marker is uh, is a marker of the microglia. So again increased. This is an another marker here. So again increased. So the idea, can we correct it now by reducing the amount of TNF-alpha, the depression? So we use the dominant negative that uh, has been described before. And uh, basically, you treat this the treatment of 12 days, and they uh, use 10 milligram per ml. And so this is the, the, the fourth swim test and the novelty suppressed feeding that I showed you before. And you see very clearly that the, this is again the time immobile that present the depression. You see that it's increased in the knocking. You add the dominant negative. Again, this is ICV, right? You do the dominant negative, it's going down. The other test, the novelty suppressed feeding, the same thing. So this is the model. So this, uh, the, the model is based on uh, many other, many data, and the, this is your data, actually. So uh, basically, the NF-kappa-B uh, alpha inhibitor is a target of the EF4E. And when it's not phosphorylated, you make less of it. So under normal condition, the NF-kappa-B, when there is no inflammation, is inhibited by the, the, the inhibitor that doesn't let it go to the nucleus. You don't get the TNF-alpha. And this is the last one before the last, before doing the acknowledgement. Uh, here, what you have, a depressive state, so the, the so basically you make uh, less now of the inhibitor of the NF kappa B. NF kappa B goes into the nucleus. You make the poor inflammatory cytokines and depression. So I want to finish with something that's the most difficult was the most difficult to do from all the experiments that I explained, and this is how to get lymphocyte from patients with depression. So you go all this uh, bureaucracy, you have to fill this and that and et cetera and this and that. So we ended up only with 24 samples that we, we measure. And we see something interesting. He wanted to put in the paper, but it's only 24. And I told him, don't, don't put in the paper. And, and basically what you see is that in female here, in the major depression disorder, you see less of phosphor EIF4E than in the wild type. So this, if this turns out true, if we can get more samples, etc., it will be, uh, I think, uh, a major, a major breakthrough, because we have all the, the the work with the mouse, and these are the people that uh, did the work. So 
So again, uh, the, this, this uh, psychiatrist, uh, Gabriela Gobi, with all her group, uh, uh, Gustavo Turecki, uh, and these are the people that did the work in the lab. Uh, so basically, this, this is again going from molecules to disease, going from basic science to, to understanding disease and, and maybe treating disease and curing people. Thank you. Again, we have time for one or two questions, but before that, I want to ask you a clarification. <laughs> yeah. So, the inflammation is mediated by the macrophages, right? Microglia. Microglia is the one that they, they, they secrete the TNF alpha. What do you mean, microglia? What In the brain. Okay. But you are testing the mRNA level where? In which cells? So we testing from uh, the, the, so we test from all the all kind of uh, first of all we the, we test the amount of protein. No, no, you check the mRNA level with the inhibitor. The mRNA level of M I don't remember which one. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So 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 we test when you looked at the AF4E and this. So we test the hippocampus. So, but th th this is mediated by the by, what? by the hematopoietic cells, no? By by macrophages, the inflammation. So inflammation. So the, the microglia are uh, are the ones that uh, that. Uh, and the macrophages in the brain. Yeah, they are yes, macrophages. He's checking the mRNA level in which. In in, in all in all in cells, brain. wherever you look, you see a difference. But uh, but the ones that secrete. The TNF alpha and all this, this are to be the microglia, not the pyramidal cells, etc. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, repurposing drugs, I mean, this can be extremely powerful in getting tools to develop more specific compounds. And I mean, having compounds that are well tolerated is a great way of getting into patients and so on. The question, though, is as many of you know with diabetes, the Compensatory changes very rapidly eliminate the benefit that you get from the insulin uh, depletion. So, I guess the question is: In mice, you can certainly use many erc specific inhibitors. Right. Do those but have this is more general? Do those have benefit? So, so the biggest problem with this erc specific one are the side effects, right? So but that's why in, in cancer, why didn't they become the, uh, you know, the, the, the major uh, the treatment? Right, but so in mice you can do the experiment. So in right. the mouse, there, there are in clinical trials right now. The what? There are MAC inhibitors in clinical trials. I know, but all the, the circles, uh, many of them are in we this. But effect, not just for this. So, so that's why uh, you, you started with repurposing, and, and you have one of the safest drugs in the world. Right? So, of course, you will use that instead of this. But again, people try that. I don't know for some, for one of the reasons is uh, this is out of patent, you cannot make much money. So, people try to make the derivatives now of, of, of the drug of metformin for obesity. So, I don't know, maybe this can be used. But the ERC for sure. You cannot compare them to, to metformin there. One more question. Good question. So, um, in your Fragile X, uh, um, have you tried rapamycin just to rule out that the TOR pathway is also important? And, uh, and sort of a side question from, the, from this uh, discussion, why would an ERK inhibitor have side effects and metformin not, <coughs> since it inhibits? Metformin, okay. So there was a, pro, a, a paper with metformin actually published, and it had the opposite effect. I must admit, I didn't read it very carefully. Why should it have the opposite effect? But I, again, metformin has many targets because it, because it acts at mTOR. And downstream of mTOR, there are about 40 different targets. So metformin was tried. And no, 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 he's asking about the safety situation. Right, the so safety. The metformin actually doesn't have side effects. It's actually beneficial in general. Yeah. And when you inhibit air, you inhibit signaling everywhere in the body. Okay. So that's... Okay.
Okay. So everybody but, should take but, it. But what about rapamycin? Performing, yeah. So, but uh, rapamycin in, in this one. In fragile X. So that's why I say it. There was a paper, but it made fragile X uh, even more, more severe or more, didn't correct. So it's, it's very interesting in terms of our data. Anyway, we have to continue with the program. You can ask me.